Okay, guys, we might as well start, I think. There's a few more people coming in, just in a minute. My name is Tim Keeley. Um, I'll be presenting patellofemoral pain today. Um, hands of you who were in my lecture just this morning. Okay, cool. Same sort of format this afternoon. You will look sort of familiar with different pictures, different words. Um, but we're going to go through, again, getting you guys understanding what patellofemoral pain is, what it means, what it does to your clients, how to rehab, how to keep in their program, how to keep them better, um, and how to basically get it right. Um, anyone in the class today that has patellofemoral pain? Okay, great. Out of you people, have you got pain when you go on one leg and squat? Have you got that sort of, anyone got anything like that? Yeah? Have you got a creaky knee as well that sort of makes a noise? Who said yep? Would you mind later coming up here and showing us your creaky knee? Would that work? Do we'll, we'll get you in a second. We'll get you in a second. I'll put you on the mic. We'll do a little trick. Okay. And we might use you later. Um, but I've got, again, I've got some videos. I've got a lot of stuff to show you, a lot of stuff to explain to get your heads around it. Welcome heaps of questions. Just fire them up here. As long as we've got time, we'll go through them one by one. All right? So, same format. Today, work on, with patellofemoral knee pain, what is it and what's going wrong? Let's work out exactly why people are getting this and what the structures are that get affected so you guys understand the basis of it. What to look for in a client who has got patellofemoral pain or is going to get it so you can spot it early. All right, so things we look for, things you guys need to look for. Um, a little touch on what we're doing, physio treatment, the rehab side of things, the goal and the focus of what we're trying to achieve and what we need to do, and then ploughing through all the rehab exercises that you need to know to get patellofemoral pain right based on what is going wrong. Um, that's the hard stuff. If you get that right, you're winning. Then we work on the same format, progress that to normal training. How do we get these people back squatting, back running, back playing sport? Um, and how do we get them sticking to it? How do we get this person doing these boring physio exercises, doing their rehab, progressing them through, and then not letting them fall off the wagon and stopping their homework and getting their problem back? So, let's start at the top. Patellofemoral knee pain. Because there's lots of different types of knee pain. We're just talking about patellofemoral. Patella meaning kneecap femoral being femur. So it's the patellofemoral joint. So the pain arising from problems in the joint and in the region of the patellofemoral joint. So when you will see a diagnosis from a doctor or physician saying he's got patellofemoral pain, we're blanketing a little bit because there's lots of different problems going to cause it and lots of maybe structures that cause it and the pain does change. Sometimes it's just, it's, there is definite pain, like an ITB syndrome, there's a swollen bursa, it is that, okay? But a lot of the time they'll come on with that, and then the next, the next week they've got pain under here. They go, I've got, I've got this new pain. Okay, the whole thing is patellofemoral pain, because it does shift and change depending on what structures are affected and what, is the, what alignment is getting affected. So try not to put it down to one injury. It's like the rotator cuff and pinch. It's not just one injury per se. It's pain in that region because of something. Okay? So, think of the structures around the patellofemoral joint. Right? You've got patella, patella, cartilage, both surfaces, femur. Right? You've got the groove at the patella sits. On the lateral side, you've got lateral retinaculum, which sort of holds that patella on the outside. You've got the VMO coming in on the medial side, hooking into the side of the kneecap to help stabilise. Patella tendon, quads tendons, ITB coming in the side, hamstrings at the back calves. It's a lot of stuff that can affect the biomechanics of how the knee joint works. All right. The other thing I want you to think about is the movement of the kneecap on the femur. And a lot of your clients who haven't studied anatomy don't understand what happens when they bend and straighten their knee. They don't really know what their kneecap does. Okay? So they think, oh, it's just you know, bends and straightens. Remember, when you bend and straighten the knee, your tibia slides under your femur and then the patella slides in the groove of the femur, okay, kneecap doesn't go on the tibia, yeah, so things to think about. Um, hip and knee alignment, when you are running or squatting or standing on one leg, you need good hip and knee alignment 
if you're going to recover from patellofemoral or not get patellofemoral pain. All right? So when you are standing on one leg, I can't have my knee rolling in. I can't have my hip dropping down. All right? So when you're thinking about this pain, you've got to think about what are the structures that are holding my knee in alignment and what exercises do I need to do to get those muscles working to hold my knee in alignment. And because a lot of the time it's the knee and patellofemoral joint coming out of alignment is the cause of the problem. Hip stabilizers. So thinking about glute med and min, thinking about lateral rotators of the hip. What do they do? How do they influence the angle of the knee, the angle of the patellofemoral joint? What are their role when they're open chain? You know, if I do abduction, my glute med and min doing this for me, but that's open chain, but when it's closed chain, they're doing this for me. Okay, same muscle, looks like a completely different position. And a lot of people train open chain expecting that the brain will then know how to do it closed chain. Okay? And if they're not working, being able to spot it. Okay? So if my glute med is not working, that means my hip's going to do that. Okay? And seeing that in people. Um, trying to dispel a few myths of a VMO. Vastus medialis obliquus. Obliquus meaning going in obliquely into the kneecap. And remember the VMO does not stop knee rolling in. Okay, so if you see a person, you know, like, a, oh, geez, their knees rolling, they did buckles like that, they do some VMO stuff. That is not because the VMO is weak. That's up here. Okay, remember the VMO is a knee extensor along with all the other three quad muscles, but its little niche role is to try and pull that kneecap medially and provide a medial force to keep it in the groove when I bend and straighten my knee and balance with my lateral retinaculum and my lateral quads and ITB. Okay? And its most important role is between 0 and 30 degrees. So it's from here to there, where my kneecap goes into the groove. I need it stabilised as it goes into the groove of the femur. When I bend my knee, when the load goes on, I need that working. So it works mostly from there to there. So where do we train it? There to there. Okay? So if I'm trying to train it down here, there's no point trying to do it down there. Right? Because its major function is from here to here. Um, talk about foot pronation. Right? So a lot of this lecture today is about VMO, hip stabilisation. What happens if their foot rolls in? Other things you've got to think about and assess. You know, if their foot is pronating on one side, maybe that's the primary cause of why their knee's rolling in rather than how strong they are here. We get people in our clinic who come and go, I've got this terrible VMO, I mean terrible patellofemoral pain, and their VMO is huge. You know, well that's not the problem. And their glutes are working really well. And they say, yeah, I only get it when I run about sort of 12K, 15K, I get this knee pain, and they pronate on one leg. So everything else is working perfect, apart from that. So there's other things to think about, not just muscle control or muscle stability. Um, so... The, the kneecap needs to sit in the groove, bottom line. Okay? If it's sitting out of the groove, or it's pulled one way even by a few millimetres, four or five millimetres, it's enough to cause problems. So we need that balance, we need to keep that balance, and sometimes it's very, very hard. Um, so you've got to think, patellofemoral pain is coming from positional fault of the patellofemoral joint. Don't just think, oh, if the kneecap's gone laterally. Okay, it can be the femur's gone medially. Rotate in. Okay, don't just think it's the kneecap's fault. It's the joint's fault. All right, it's what's happening with the joint and you've got to work out which structure is causing what, what's rolling in. All right? Um, and it's the effect on their structures. So is it the fat pad that's getting impinged when I straighten my knee? Is it the bursas around the ITB, bursas sitting under the kneecap, the infratella bursas? Is it my patella tendon is getting loaded on an angle and I'm getting a patella tendonitis? Right. Is it my cartilage getting worn away on one side because I'm just doing too much loading on the lateral side? Is it getting too weak on the medial side because I'm not loading it? All those sort of things. And you know, is it soft tissue? Is it, is it ITB work? Is it ITB problems? Is it the plica, the thickening of the tissue on the outside? Is it, just, is it just cartilage pain I'm getting or bone pain that I'm getting? Okay, let's have a look at a video. I want to show you, just so what I've just talked about, it sort of resonates 
with you about what's happening with the patellar groove. So, there's your knee. Now, all anatomy videos, like a few on the last ones, that's not quite perfect. So when you see the VMO on this, it'll look like a tendon. If you look at your VMOs, if you've got good VMOs, if you look at your VMO, the muscle goes right into there. Okay, so it's the, the muscle blends into the tendon. So my muscle, that is not tendon, that's muscle. Okay, so the t muscle blends into a very short tendon right into the bone. Okay, on this one you'll see sort of a very long tendon, which is a poor representation. It's the best video I could find, I'm sorry. And I searched a lot. So, what happens is when you bend your knee, this is what you've got to explain to patients. See how that patella moved down? into the groove. If that patella is sitting wrong, it's going to cause positional fault and you overload that, it's going to cause problems. Alright? And when it comes up again, back up into the groove. So we'll keep going. You think about that, that's what happens. You put some muscles over top. They should come in in a minute. And... Wait one more time, he has to bend his knee one more time. There it is. Now, this is the incorrect drawing. That's supposed to be your VMO. <laughs> okay, but it's not a very good representation. See it over there? It's not a very good representation, but think of it as a bigger muscle than that. Okay? Um, but you can see how those muscles and tendons help glide that patella through the groove. So, again, what are those it's the muscle systems that are affecting what that kneecap does? But it also, if they're working fine, but I move the femur underneath, because it's a joint that can slip and slide, we can all move our kneecap left and right. Okay, so if I'm, my kneecap's sitting out and I do that, it's got to ride up incorrectly. Okay, that might be a muscle fault. All right, got the idea? Now, I'll come to that one in a moment. So, when you're talking to clients about you know, patellofemoral pain, it might be a tracking issue, and you've got to try and explain that to them with the kneecap. So, primary cause, incorrect position of the patellofemoral joint, plus your overload, and that's what's going to give you problems and symptoms. So, it can be joint pain. Okay, we can physically, if you just get muscles stronger and you keep the alignment, their pain goes away, they haven't actually really injured or inflamed anything. They're getting a little bit of loading pain in their knee. That can be telephemoral pain. They can get full-blown soft tissue pain, and bursitis and, and, and ITB problems from a lot of excessive rolling in and ITB moving and whipping over that bursa. Okay, and they can be really, really tight through it, which causes them pain underneath. They have really tight glutes can be the problem, okay, causing that sort of tissue damage. Um, so, those sort of things can turn, you know, give you pain, give you problems, and turn into things like tendinopathy. So if you're getting weakness and pain for a long period of time around that joint, things start degenerating, things start getting worse, and you can start developing tendinopathy. So three months ago, they had this, you had this ITB problem, it sort of went away, I stopped running, but now I'm doing squats, I'm getting this pain in here, my really sore tendon under here. Because what's happened is they've got the original problem, they rested it, so the inflammation went down, but meanwhile, that pain and that lack of exercise has made some of the other tissues weaker, and now they are causing pain when they try and do exercise. So you can develop secondary problems. Um, the other one is cartilage wear. So you can get roughening and wear and tear on the lateral surface of the cartilage because the kneecap's shifted over. It usually moves laterally. But also if you do that, and you'll see on a video in a second, when that moves over, cartilage needs to be used. Okay, and a lot of the time you'll hear surgeons talk about um, arthritis starting in the non-weight bearing side of the joint. And you're going, how is that possible? You know, why, why, why is that? Because cartilage is a structure that needs compression and force by synovial fluid to push through it to keep it healthy. Okay, if you're not keeping those cartilage surfaces pushed together and that fluid squeezed in between them, okay, they get malnutritioned and they start softening and then you start losing their structure and that's how you start getting arthritis. And in the knee when that starts happening, it usually happens on the medial side of the kneecap and on the femur you get what they call chondromalacia patellae. And it's softening of that cartilage. Because they're not using it. You know, one side they're using it too much, one side they're not using it and it's turning into a bit of a nightmare. But if you correct that positional fault and you take away the weight loading on one side and you increase it back on the other side, 
very carefully, you'll find their pain shifts and changes and starts getting better, despite the level of wear and tear they've got. So a lot of people come in, they've got creaky, grindy kneecaps, and they sort of, you move and you go, oh my God, and it's all sore. But they, you get the right exercise and the right alignment, and they go fine. So there are a lot of people can, if the kneecap is sitting perfectly, sometimes it doesn't matter how much wear and tear they've got, how much arthritis they've got. Because if they've got the muscle strength and they've got the balance, you may find that their patellofemoral pain goes away because the patellofemoral pain is from poor alignment not necessarily from, oh, it's worn and torn there. Okay, you take those, the worn and torn surface away and you increase the pressure of the soft surface and that strengthens up, bingo. And you'll see on this in video. Um, but for you guys, muscle-wise, as soon as you get pain in the knee, within the first week or so, that vastus medialis obliquus starts falling to sleep. And if any of you have had surgery or major knee trauma, you'll know that happens. Especially the surgery, it's day one, the just muscle goes and just goes to sleep. It depends on the level of pain. You know, you go into surgery and come out and you're on morphine, that's a high level of pain, that VMO, and it's around that knee that VMO is going to go to sleep. Okay, when the VMO shuts off, then you've got no hope of keeping that knee in the groove, you've got no hope of doing knee bending work, therefore you're going to lose this as well. So you get pain messaging here, okay, can't bend your knee, can't stabilise on one leg, you don't stabilise on one leg, you lean on the other one, this one doesn't work, you start losing hip stability and then that vicious circle starts happening. If I don't have hip stability, then my knee's going to roll in. If my knee rolls in, I can't keep alignment and I can't even work my VMO. So how am I going to get right? It's a bit of a hard one. So try and remember that it's not just about the tracking, it's about what happens to the muscle systems as well and how are we going to get those muscle systems balancing up together very carefully to get them out of pain and then get them stronger, get them so strong and so much endurance and control that they can run again or play sport or squat or whatever they want to do. Other things you've got to think about, some people have super big kneecaps and small patellofemoral grooves and you're going, what am I going to do with that? All right. Some people have congenital dislocations, you go, they're really super, super loose and they've dislocated their three times when they're a kid and they've torn all the lateral all the lateral structure, uh, the medial structures away and they're all tight in their lateral structures. Okay? They, they, they're going to be really hard work. The kneecap's really sloppy. You may find that no amount of VMO and glute work is going to keep it stable enough to enable them to do any run, sort of running. Some people have very, very wide hips and a very big Q angle. It's going to play havoc with trying to keep good a knee line, but they're always going to do this sort of thing. Because the wider the hips are and the more the angle, the harder it is for these muscles to stabilise and hold that angle. Therefore, they're not as strong. So they go on one leg and, and start doing this sort of thing. So if they get problems with their knee, which usually happens from they're trying to do a lot of fitness because they've been unfit and they get injured, but they've got this massive problem before that that they've got to try and fix to try and get that problem right. Meanwhile, they're trying to keep fit and they're trying to lose weight. can be very difficult for those sort of people. Things to think about. So for you guys, again, if you can understand the, patella, the way the patellofemoral pain works, the way the injuries work, get a better understanding yourself, then you'll be able to help those clients a lot more. Because right? you can explain it to them. Say, this is why, what's going wrong. See your knee, it's rolling in. We've got to work on your hip stuff. If you don't explain it, they won't do the exercise. Okay? Can't we just do squats and get my quads better? Can't I just do leg extensions and get my quads better? Because that's what I read in a book. You know? Can't we do that? But if you explain it to them well enough, you'll get it right and keep them on board. All right. Second video. Now, what I mean is, when you look at this video, uh, I'll show you the patella tracking one and then I'll show you what a perfect one legged squat looks like. Um, when, I, when you're looking at a one legged squat, what you've got to look for is the hip height. Okay? You really want to keep at least level. I prefer you be like this because when you walk, we've got a built in program in our brain that says when I stand on one leg and do that, I've got my stabiliser on this side to lift my hip so my foot clears the ground. If I don't, I'll catch it. Okay, that's what it's for. Right, when I stand on one leg, I need my, all these muscles here going lift and not lift here, but lift here to clear that ground through there and stabilise and then push through. All right? What that then does is keep, when I lift here, I've got normal alignment here, which allows me to keep normal alignment at the knee. All right? And my VMO is working, my kneecap stays in the groove, and I'm fine. As soon as I lose that, 
My femur is going to angle in and roll in. Because remember, your glute med and many lateral rotators okay, help adduct and externally rotate. Okay. So if they're not working, I'm going to adduct and internally rotate, aren't I? If they're not working. Right, so that's something I've got to work on. So at least keep your le you're looking for keeping a hip level, at least level or higher, and you're looking at making sure that knee doesn't roll inwards. And like you know, with the foot pronation, sometimes it's harder. And if you can do it in bare feet, okay, it means you're doing really well. Most people do it in shoes, and they hide the fact that they're pronating because of their shoes good or they've got an orthotic in there. Oopsie. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Now, this first one, again, best one I could find particular. It's sponsored by a knee brace, and I'm not endorsing knee braces because we're doing an exercise session today. So hopefully I'll stop it before the knee brace thing comes in. Hopefully there won't be a little ad in front of it. Q-Lock is the company. So, with this one, again, it's going to give you a bit of an idea of you're looking at your right knee there. What I want, if you look at this, is that kneecap sitting in the groove like that. Okay? And keeping an even force through there. Imagine that line they've just drawn as cartilage and fluid. Okay? There's no gap in there. It's all full of fluid. And what you're not seeing is the, cartilage, the thin cartilage surface, the nice white surface, on each side. Okay? So if that pressure's even, if my quads, because when I extend my leg, it pulls my kneecap into the groove, and if that compression's really nice, the joint loves it, loves compression like that. All right, keeps it in the groove, all the muscles working, nicely balanced, perfect. If my VMI was weak, what tends to happen is this. Come on. There's my VMI. We'll buzz it along a little bit. If my VMO is weak, it can do two things. Lateral glide and lateral tilt. And you can see this on people, and you can feel it on some people. They can get your, knee, your finger right underneath that medial side, and you can't even get it on the lateral side. And you can see it's just sitting like this. Okay? Because the structures on one side are so tight, and the structures on one side are so weak. Now, can you imagine what's going to happen if I put all the force that I need to do that, through one area. Yeah? It's going to load up this area here on the outside here. All right? And this area is not getting used as much. All right? All my force is wrong. My alignment of my talofemoral is wrong. So whether it's a tilt, lateral glide, whether the femur is moved inwards because I've rolled inwards. So if you think, well, this is my knee. If my structures are tight and pulls my kneecap outwards and this is weak, it lets it go. That's fine. But if I, I can have a pretty good VMO, but if I roll inwards, my lateral structures are going to angle that way. My, and my force line is here. Okay, going through there. So I might have a great VMO, but if I've got weak buttock here because I've had back pain before or hip surgery, then I can still get patellofemoral pain with a good VMO. Because it's not all about, it's about the VMO. This is just indication. So imagine you've got that weak VMO, it shifts. This is a very much a medical um, diagram of it. It does that, just to give you sort of an idea of what I mean. And then, very slow video, this one. If that force that you want that was like that, then does that. Okay, you can start getting changes in the bone, changes in the cartilage, and then the other two areas. I mean, that's a very gross exaggeration of how far it can go. Will get softened, okay, which gives you secondary problems, and creaking and groaning and cracking and all that sort of thing. Okay. So let's look at someone who's really, 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 really good, and this is a triathlete. And I got this from the gate guys, who are really good. Now, what he's going to do, you can see the VMO on that, on that person. That's pretty awesome, right? Do you want to give us some lights again? Just a little bit, off, just so I can see that. <laughs> nice. 
not all of them, just the front ones. Okay. So, there's your VMI. Looks pretty good, isn't it? You'd expect that in a triathlete, right? They've got to run how many k's and cycle. Right? They need, they cannot afford to have their knee out of alignment at all. This person knows has got really good control. It's just to show you what it, what it, what happens when you see good control versus bad control. So they're, they're showing you bad control even though they don't have bad control. This is good so far. See the height of that left hip above the right, okay, and nicely through the middle there. Now what's going to happen is that's, that's is she's going to roll inwards poorly. There it is there. See that? So she's purposely rolling her knee in. She's good though. But see that alignment now. There's the middle of the hip. If I draw a straight line down to there, you wonder why people get knee pain here. Okay, because my force is out. Okay, so my femur's rolled in. She's got an awesome VMI. But her femur is rolled in. Alright? And her hip's dropped. So what she does, I can't actually work out it's a hair, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's a shoe. And she corrects it. So she's corrected her knee alignment. Now, that's great. You see how that VMO's fired up a little bit more now? But this isn't right. So she needs to correct that. So she's going to have to lift that hip there. And then correct that knee, and then push up in that position there. Wouldn't be great if we could all squat like that. All right? But that's what you're looking for, for a good squat. If you're not getting that alignment there, you're not getting that knee alignment, something needs to be worked on. She's so good, she can actually just tell her brain to do it, and she's been cued, lift your hip, blah, 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 do all that. A lot of people can't do that. They have to practice the exercise. Lights, please. They have to practice the exercise. They have to practice all the strengthening so the brain at least does it a little bit automatic and then practice good alignment so that automatic function becomes even better. All right? Okay. So that's what you're looking for. And again, I'll go through each exercise and I'll show you what you need to look for on each exercise as well. Um, so a few things, just to recap on what to look for. Constant intermittent pain. So constant pain, if they're constantly painful, constantly thinking it's just on there all the time, then it's usually constant inflammation. Something is damaged badly that's enough that's given permanent pain. Yes? Sorry, Tim. Um, just coming back to the video a second, you notice that it's only coming slightly off the floor. Is there any indication that that means slightly off the floor? Yep. Remember, we all prone She's in bare feet. And she's pro she might be in really good shoes and orthotics. <laughs> she might need that. Uh, but it shows you, yeah, she's compensating a little bit in bare feet. She's not running in bare feet. So there's a bit to be said about maybe her shoes are helping that part. We talked about how maybe if she did run in bare feet, you know, maybe bare feet running is not so good. Yeah. Um, constant intermittent pain. So intermittent pain is usually, they only go, yeah, it hurts. So it hurts there, and then it's got to go on, and then it hurts there again. It's almost like shoulder impingement, okay? So ow, 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 ow. As that kneecap moves over either poor surfaces, like sore surfaces, okay? in and out of the groove, or there's a certain angle where the kneecap doesn't get pulled in the groove well enough and it hurts all the other structures. Okay, there's a loading position pain. Um, sometimes the pain is only after a certain amount of time running okay, or cycling. Okay, and that's a build-up of irritation. Um, you'll see the change in tracking with some people. Some people, when they squeeze their quad, their kneecap moves up and far too out. It's supposed to move up and a little bit out, okay? Well, not so much that goes accessory sideways compared to the other side. Um, crackling and cracking. You reckon you've got a crackly kneecap? Really loud? Uh, usually every time I get up, but it hasn't done it today. But I'm really sore because I did a lot of Do you want to come up here and have a, we'll have a little listen? Some of you guys probably heard what I hear about by crackling and cracking. So this is what we call crepitus in the world of physio. Your ITB hurts today, do you hear that? Okay. Okay, stand on one leg. I have terrible balance. We can't hear anything. Oh, oh, God. Never mind, that's all right. Did you see how she struggled, though, to try and bend one leg? Did you notice that? 
Okay, so cracking is that sort of movement. Okay, now you can hypothesise all you like about what that is. You know it's something to do with the cartilage surface. Okay, whether it's fissuring, cracking, condomination, patella, doesn't really matter. The problem is you've got a problem there. Yeah. Yours cracked? Do you want to hear a little? We'll maybe come to you in a minute. Yeah. Um, hip drop, classic. Okay, so they stand on one leg and do that. So that's a weakness there. It's got to be here. Sometimes they even do it on a squat, on two legs. So they might squat down and go, like that, it's a bit excessive. Okay? Or they squat away one side. Now, if I'm not perfect and I squat, I might not drop my hip, but if I rotate here, my force changes on both, doesn't it? Okay, and that might be a weakness through here. I'm not quite that great with my core, my trunk, and my thoracic control. Internal rotation of femur, so they just naturally stand. They stand normal, but their femur's rolled in or their kneecap's rolled in. It's a weakness here. Some people compensate for that, and they do the opposite. And they foot out here. Then when they naturally stand, they just sort of walk on the spot, and one foot's poking out. And it's usually doing that due to weakness of the same muscles that externally rotate anything. Why is that? Because if I put that, if the one knee caps, if they're doing that to keep their knee in a line, if I put their foot in a line, their knee will be in. So they go, rather than strengthen up this muscle, the brain goes, I'll just shorten it. And I'll do that. And they usually really tighten that side. Because a shortened muscle has got that sort of relative increase in strength and control when it's shorter. When it's longer, it's more difficult to activate the muscle. Okay, so your body's natural instinct is to do that. And you may find they might squat like this to make it easier on their knees. Because they haven't got as much hip control. Okay, it's much harder to squat like that, isn't it? Okay, than it is like that. Right? Because you have to use your gluteal stabilizers and your lateral hip stabilizers in a mid-range position, which is harder than a shortened range position. Um, the ITB will be tight. The glutes will be tight. The quads will be tight on that leg. Yeah? And sometimes we get people in, they've got a little bit of pain here, a little bit of pain here. We can't find anything wrong with them, but they're tight in their ITB, tight in their quads and tight in their glutes. And they stretch them out and the pain goes away. You know, is that pain just from, mecha it's mechanical pain. So again, patellofemoral pain. They may not be physically tissue damaged enough to cause them any inflammation or anything like that, but they've still got pain. And that leads to VMO weakness and hip stabilisation weakness. But if you catch it early and get them stretched out, they might be foam rolling their ITB, loosening their glutes off, get the same as the other side, then they come right. But why is it tight? Maybe it is because they've got a weakness underlying there. So you get rid of the tightness and then really when you test them, Actually, you are weak there and there because they usually do the stretching for a bit. They feel great. Feels good. Stop the stretching because that fixed it. And then it slowly creeps back again. And it's getting tighter usually due to weakness. Right? Maybe it's their non-dominant side. They're so good with their brain over the years since they were three learning how to kick a ball and stand on one leg and that sort of thing. Just like left and right-handed, people are left and right-footed. We're just not as different on left and right foot because we use them all the time, weight-bearing and doing lots of stuff. So the difference is less than hands. Okay? But it's the same mentality as you're trying to throw a ball with your weak hand. It's just impossible, right? And when you, if you kick with it, the other foot's like, can't kick with that foot. I can kick, but I'm not as good. So if you think about all the problems and all the muscle control issues and all the strength that involves not being able to kick a ball, then what happens when you go running? And left and right foot. And you expect to be exactly the same. You're not going to be exactly the same. And this is where these problems come back. Now, is it just because they're just genetically like that and we're all humans and we've got left and right sides? Okay, well, if, we, if we do and we're going to do something bilateral, then we need to make sure we're strengthening up one side okay, to keep that nice little evenness. And the thing is, again, I'll come to it later, people ask about why, how long do I need to do these exercises for? Do I have to keep, why do I have to keep doing them forever? And I say, well, it's like... I, if I teach you, if you're a tennis player and I teach you how to, say you're a right-hand tennis player and you're so good at it, right? I teach you for a year how to become a tennis player on your left hand, but you're a tennis player on your right hand for 30 years. And I teach you for a year on your left hand and you are absolutely as perfect your left as your right after that year. You're so good. If you stop for a year and you go back to tennis, which one's going to be better? Right. So you stop fitness, you stop exercising for that period of time, what's going to be better? The Right. 
because your pathways are set, well, apart from if you talk to the neuroplastic people, but most of them are set, and so you, you, know, you, you lose, you don't learn, you keep everything in that memory bank, okay? You can't rewire yourself completely. You still rely on something that's been wired forever. And sometimes that's, that's the major problem that you guys will face, is keeping those people on board if their injury happened from being left or right-handed or left or right-footed. So, we've gone through that one. Physio treatment. What are we going to do with these people? Well, first thing, if you get people that you see hip-dropping, they've got pain in their knee, they've got malalignment of their kneecap, you can't because their foot's pronating, they've got big difference left and right, you think they've got a bit of injury, get it assessed, get exactly work out what the problem is. Is their foot, do they need orthotics? Okay, is it, do they need lots of glute stretching or glute exercise? Is their VMO absolutely fine? Okay, get a physio assessing that and working with you guys, and if you're a physio out there, working with the personal trainer to try and make sure that that rehab goes all the way through from start to finish. Sorry, Tim, you mentioned orthotics there. So are you very much an orthotic to just deload the, the problem and then re re-strengthen it or orthotics for a long-term solution? Most of the time people who need orthotics stay in them. Yep. Yep. So I would... It's, think about orthotics... Okay, you say you're, you've got problems left and right and your glutes and your VMO, you've got probably a weak on one side and you're strengthening up because of a deficit. Okay? Now if you've got pronation that's permanent on one side, you're not really going to change that much. If you just put it on the in for a little bit and take it out, that's like stopping doing exercises for it. So, you know, and you can do all the arch lifting and all that stuff you like, but when you want to run 21Ks, you need something that to control that if you're pronating that much that it causes knee pain. Um, so we do a lot of stuff for physio, as you guys probably know. Um, the big thing that I think that you'll find when you get a good physio, working with the trainer, is the advice that the physio will give about the injury to keep that person on board, to do their exercises for long enough, and to progress them for long enough to get back training, and then keeping their program to get it 100%. And like I said this morning, there's a lot of people will find that they'll do their exercises, the physio physio calms it down, yes, yeah, feeling good, when can I run again? And if they say, oh, you know, any pain? Oh, you try running. But they haven't tested them out and put them through their paces and seeing how strong they can get and all that sort of thing and fix the problem. All right? So they have about three or four weeks off running or whatever sport they're doing. The pain goes away. And they go back to running. They stop the physio. Or they go back to their squats or whatever they're doing. The pain comes back. And then they go, oh, the physio didn't really work, did it? The pain's back. It's just they didn't give enough exercise or didn't stay on board for long if they didn't do enough sessions, whatever they didn't do to make sure that, and they didn't carry it through when they're running. You can't do rehab and then go expect to go sport and running without keeping your rehab going. Your rehab's just got you out of pain. You haven't even tested it yet. So your job is to make sure that, you know, take these people and get them through their rehab and keep it in their program and progress. Okay, now you're going to do a little bit of sport, now you're going to be 2Ks running, you're going to do a bit of leg press, we're doing all this sort of thing and keeping that rehab in that program all the way through until they are doing exactly 100%. And then try and work out how much you need to keep in there to keep them at that level and stop them dropping down. Otherwise, again, they're going to say those rehab exercises didn't work because I felt good, but now the pain's back. Well, did you stop doing the exercises? Yeah, but I thought I'd need to do them because I was out of the pain. So it's their perception of what the exercises do for them and how long they need to do them for. And that's a communication thing with us. We need to address that and we need to be confident that this is what you've got to do and I want you to do it for this amount of time and trust me, it's going to work, otherwise you'll be back in here. Um, so we need to restore hip stabilizers. The hip stabilizers are weak or the control is weak, we need to get that back. We need to get back the patellofemoral joint on, we need to get that knee working in a vertical plane. Okay, it's a hinge joint. There is rotation in it because there's a bit of give when you're doing this sort of thing. Of course there is. But when you're doing running or squats, you want to be in alignment because if squats is load, running is load from the ground up. Okay, you can't afford to have that knee rolling in like this for 3,000 times. You know. Basketball's fine. Unless you're Kobe Bryant the other day. Okay, but you don't want to be doing heavy loaded positions with one leg going in. Okay, so you've got to correct that alignment. We've got to build their strength, build their endurance. You start with the boring physio exercises, you get them on board, you show them the game out of pain, and then you progress them. And you put not just weight on, you put difficulty on. 
Okay? Make the exercise more difficult, not necessary to stack on the weight and load up the leg press. Okay? You start adding on getting more muscles working, more core working, because this is more of a postural problem than it is a power problem. Um, put that into your gym routine. Getting them on board, like I said, physios. I find in our practices, if you don't see a client enough, they don't get a good outcome. And it sounds like, oh, you're just making money. But what's better for the client? Getting better faster and keeping them on board and then raving about you because, you know, oh, he's awesome, he got me better. Or you're not confident enough to treat them enough times to get them better fast enough so they believe in you and then what happens is they go, oh, I'm not really better yet, it's not really working, no, he's no good. Because you're only seeing them once a week. You can't get better once a week. Okay? So make sure they're having enough personal training sessions and enough physio sessions to get this problem sorted quick enough because people haven't got time to wait six months to get better. They want to get better now. So you've got to work hard and get these people coming in enough so you can make a difference and make a change early so then they trust you to, when you say this is going to take you three months and you've got to keep these doing exercises, they'll say, oh, you're good because these ones worked. You, 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 you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. because they I think pain is gone, it's fixed. But in saying that, sometimes patellofemoral pain is that bad that they need to have a specialist looked at it. Okay? They need, might need a scan. They might need a scan to say, this is how bad your injury is, you have to do these exercises for the rest of the year. Okay? Give them a scan to show, see what I mean? Right? So sometimes that is needed for these people as well, and for your sake. Right, so, second part of what we're going to go through, rehab stuff. So I've split this into two, like I did with the shoulder. We've got hip stabilisation we're going to focus on, and VMO and quads we're going to focus on, because those are two areas we're working on to keep that alignment. I'm not going to talk too much about core today. I expect you guys know what you're doing there. Hip stabilisation exercise, so we're thinking about glute med, glute min, lateral rotators. Everything that is keeping my pelvis level the most and my hip and knee in a line the most. And when you think about glute max, it's a really good, you know, we need glute max, but glute max fires a very complex muscle. It fires on demand and it fires mostly from flexion to extension. Okay, so from the more flexion you get, the more it's going to work. Okay, up in here, and bang, it's going to work more. All right, so if you get deeper into flexion with some of the things like lunges and, and squats, it's going to help assist, give you some more power and some more strength to do your exercises. Okay, but when you think about glutes, so I've got to work my physio here, I'm going to work on my glutes. Not necessarily glute max we want to fire, but if it is really weak, okay, maybe that's why they're not they're getting problems. They still have to work on engaging it. But the biggest primary focus is actually glute med and min and the lateral rotators, which you sort of don't feel that much. Glute med and min you feel when they're sore because you dig in here and it's really sore at the top. Okay? Glute max is not usually sore unless you've done a thousand squats. Okay? You get a bit of DOMS there, but that pain that's not DOMS, you get, oh shit, what's that? That's usually glute med and min being tight or weak and they're sore. Um, when you go down to VMO and quads exercises, because don't, don't just think VMO. It might be their quads are really weak as well. Okay? You've just got to know what the VMO role is. Um, closed chain versus open chain. We try and stay closed chain for as long as we can before we go open chain. Remember, closed meaning for foot. My foot is planted, my body moves relative to my foot. Open chain, my foot moves relative to my body. This gets a lot more stabilisation going. This requires stabilisation. Okay, so once you've got your stabilisation, then you move to open chain because open chain is part of daily life and it's a lot of very functional activity, especially when you're playing sport and running. Um, and you'll find that some of these exercises, every time you're doing hip stability work, you're firing BMO. All right. So you're actually working on VMO stuff. So you've got to be sometimes a little bit careful about how much load you're putting through the knee if it's really sore to try and do hip stuff. Um, and the way it works when we're 
because we're weight bearing, there's minimal need to do, oh, I must work on my VMO or isolate it. Okay, it's more about trying to get integrated with hip stabilization in the brain and the motor control is a better outcome scenario for you. So don't try and think I've just got to do leg extensions. I have got leg extensions in there and I'll show you why later. Um, isometric isokinetic. Remember, trying to st isometric is a lot easier to start with. Okay, and build up some endurance and get that muscle firing and then move to isokinetic. So think closed chain, isometric, moving to isokinetic, open chain, isokinetic meaning moving. All right? Got to work with your knee, you've got to work like the shoulder in the pain free range. If you're creating your injury pain, you're creating negative messaging going up, it's going to affect the ability for the brain to run that program of squatting or knee alignment, what it's trying to do effectively. So you can't push through the pain. Remember, injury pain is different to pain from, oh, I'm doing heavy squats, it's really burning my quads. Okay, good pain, you know. So make sure you're training pain-free range. If they, if they have squatting and they're doing, oh, it hurts there, well, don't go down there. Only work in the range they got. Well, it feels like I'm not doing anything. Well, you're doing something. You know, you can't expect to get better if you go into that pain all the time because it just doesn't work. I haven't seen anyone that goes through pain and gets better with this sort of thing. Reps and sets, same sort of thing. Rehab, four sets on the weak side, 15 reps when you're doing isokinetic, two sets on the good side every day. Um, when you're doing isometric, 10 second holds, 10 reps. If you can do two sets of that, great. Some people don't have enough time. Um, and working on your left and right differences is a priority. Okay. Right, here we go. So, in order, what you should be trying to work on is this. Prone glutes, glute bridges, clams, side-lying leg raises, four-point up extension, ball up extension. Physio engines and step-downs, I've got a star there because... They are great VMO exercises and sometimes if the patient's good enough, they are the first exercise I give them because their glutes might be working and I want to move them straight into VMO work but I want to combine it with some glute stuff. So I go, they're straight into physio lunges, straight into step downs. And I'll explain what the difference between step down and a single leg squat and a physio lunge and a normal lunge is. All right, but that's what you should be trying to work for. With your prone glutes, isometric hold 10 seconds. Make sure they don't arch their back at that point there. Okay? Why do you reckon my knee's bending? Hamstrings firing over my glutes? Yep. It's very hard for me to keep a straight leg, but also very tight in my hemis too. Okay, I can't get the length. It wants to shorten. It wants to, it's my motor pad and says, no, no, bend, bend everything, bend everything. I'm trying to very hard to straighten my leg. should be straight. So my flaws. What do you do then? Lower. Work on the lower. Okay, they start bending their knee like that. They're firing their hamstring up to help their glute out. Okay, my position, my glutes work okay, but my core stability is not as good. So mine, the body type where I go, hamstrings and back. Okay. They try to make up for, because of course stability is no good, so it goes hamstrings, right, to try and get that pattern of movement going. I need to work on my core. Yeah, you see these people, so these are the sort of things you need to pick up. All right? Very, very awesome exercise to activate glute max. Okay, and get some stability back and fire. Remember, when you're using that, you are firing glute me, glute men, lateral rotators, you're firing everything. Okay, they all work. The bias is on glute max. It's a very good way of getting things working because especially when you've got problems with glute medium and lateral rotators but their glute max is poor. It's just flabby. It's just not doing anything. And some people get knee pain just because they've just got no bum. It's not doing anything. Great one to get it firing. But you've got to do 10 second holds. You've got to do at least 10 of them. Try and do two sets and they've got to do it every day. Okay? And it's a lot. But it needs to be fired. You get it going. People just don't do it. It's boring. You know? What am I doing? Right? But it makes a big difference. All of a sudden their tone comes back and that tone and that positive missing and the ability, I can feel it working, then relays into their pattern of movement when they squat and it fires better in their squat. And then they control their pelvis better and things feel better. And then they can strengthen better. 
You can't really get a good knee without good bum. Yeah? Great one to do. Bridges. Who hasn't done bridges? These are glute bridges though. So when you're doing Pilates bridges, you do back extension. Okay, so you come up and full back extension, full hip extension, okay? But if I promote back extension over glutes, when you've got someone who's got weak glutes, then that's not promoting the right thing. So I only want the person to go up as high as they can go to keep a neutral spine. Alright? And their glutes have got to be doing most of the work. The trick with this, and write this one down, well I've got it there, sorry, push through your heels. And you can try this at home or in the break. When you do this, you've got to push your heels down through the floor. Imagine though you're pushing heels down into the floor and that fires your glute max a little bit better and all your hips stabilise a little bit better. Put a band around your knees and you fire your glute med and lateral rotators even more. Before you even lifted, you've got everything switching on. So you've got isometric work on, they're all loaded up with a band and pushing your heels down. Everything's switching, switching on, so your pre-motor is working before you even lift your bum. And remember, this position from there is a squat, isn't it? That's a squat movement. Let's go from there to there. You're just doing it unloaded. A lot of people don't realise that this is the end of a squat position, end of a deadlift. That position there is a bridge. So if you can get that right, then your movement in deadlifts is going to be better and squats is going to be better. Okay? So put a band around one-legged. You've got to make sure that that hip doesn't drop. So if I'm doing a bridge here, and I come up, when I raise my leg, I can't drop down on that side. Because then this is switching off. So they've really got to push down on one side a little bit more than the other. And a little trick to one if you want to fire the VMO isometrically is when you push your heel down, push it forward. Don't move it forward, but push it forward. Like push your force down and forward into the floor. And that'll switch on. Because you're technically doing isometric knee extension. Yeah? On one leg. Which means you'll get one side working, which is the side you want. If you're on two legs, you don't really feel the difference because you're stabilised through the pelvis into the other leg. If you take one leg away, all you've got is that one side. Some people can't go to one leg bridges because they just don't have the control. They cannot keep their hips stable. They stay on two leg bridges. And what they do is then you take off maybe 40% load off one side. Put it, you know, more on 60% on this side, then 80% in 20, and then 90% in 10, and then finally lift it off. Awesome exercise. So underutilised, that one. So underutilised. Clams. Classic. Yeah? But, again, it's about the cueing. You're not allowed to let that hip roll. What you've got to try and do is push those heels together. And the muscle I want working, if you go greater trochanter here, I always say just the bony point in the hip. Everyone's got a bony point in their hip. And you go right behind it into the soft part, the dip there, before your glute max almost. Right there is where you want to be firing. Now, when you push your heels together, so if you say push your heels together and squeeze your bum where your thumb is, they'll usually get something. Then you've got to cue them, don't just lift your knee, I want you to use that, squeeze that muscle and use that muscle to lift your knee. And they'll get that sort of idea, they'll get, at least get something. Once they can feel that, okay, now use that one. All right? And it'll burn, and it'll be great. And that's helping your lateral rotation. All right? But you're trying to do a closed chain because your foot's down. You get better activation with that. Put a band on. One band, double band. All right? Awesome exercise. Great prepping exercises. You know, we talk about how am I going to get them doing these exercises long term in my gym program. So, okay, warm up, we're going to do some clams before you do some squats. Pretty easy, right? Rather than getting just on a bike. Get them doing their rehab as their warm up. Sorry, yes. That's the progression, yeah. Pilates progressions, yep. Yeah. Even harder, yeah. And a lot of the time, yeah, these things you've. I don't know if you've even done Pilates, but it's hard. And sometimes it's harder than what their level is. And a lot of people go to Pilates too injured, you know. So you've got to make sure that they're ready for it. But it's, Pilates is an awesome way to keep rehab in their gym program. 
Okay, if they can, what we do with a lot of people with back pain is get them up to the level where they can handle Pilates, they're pain free and they're into it and they know how to draw on their core and they say, go and do a Pilates class once a week because you know you're going to lose them because they're out of pain. And they haven't got a personal trainer, they need to be in Pilates doing something to keep the same principles going. Keeping that motivation going. Again, another Pilates thing. Side leg link rest. Now this is open chain. Okay? Open chain. They have to be good at the closed chain stuff first, really. But this is open chain. For glute med, glute min. Abduction. Make sure they're not rolling backwards and using their TFL. All right, again, get their thumb in, that sore part of their bum, and make that muscle work. This is definitely a, warm, a really good warm-up exercise for when you're doing closed chain work. It's just firing that muscle up. Don't put any load on it. It's just activating, 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 activating. All right? Better to throw this in before all the other hard stuff, all the compound movements. Get that muscle at least alive, get it firing, get it warmed up. Okay, awesome exercise. But don't use it as a form of your primary muscle exercise to fix hip stability. Okay, doing these doesn't fix this. It helps warm it up to get the muscle firing so then you can do the next exercise and the next exercise and the next exercise. Four point hip extension, this is now being getting way more complex because you're involving a lot of core. Okay, they have to keep their lumbar spine are neutral and stable so they can fire their glute max okay, and get all those muscles working. Keep their knee in a line. Don't let their knee fall out to the side or anything like that or fall in. Give them to work on how to control that knee so all the muscles are working together to keep that knee in a line. All right? Push your heel up to the ceiling is the trick. And they'll get to the point where the hip flexors are too tight they want to arch their back. Okay, so don't go beyond that point. All right? Trick is like when they, when they start arching their back, when they push, when they start arching, think about it and say, okay, hold a plank. And they go, oh, okay. And they learn how to do that. They compensate a little bit with their obliques, but at least they're not going to that sort of pattern. Okay, so don't get them trying too hard. Definitely add a band on. Once they've got their stability good, or they've already got really good core stability, add that band on. Get some resistance going. Get that muscle really firing. Because it's quite hard to feel your glute in that range. It's quite hard to get it going unless you really get it firing. So these people who haven't got glutes that are firing very well, it's actually quite difficult. If you've got some sort of resistance to push against, you get a little bit better activation. It's like doing squats with no bar. It's like, you know, but as soon as you put sort of 20 kilos, I'm like, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing now. Yeah, you've got a bit of force to react against. All right? So give that TheraBand a shot. Now, this exercise is just a different form of doing glute bridges. Yep, just a little bit better range. All right? Make sure, and this teaches you how to deadlift at the top and squat top at the top perfectly. You know these people who you sometimes see they deadlift and they arch their back and then they come up and do that? Right, so this teaches them to get back into neutral. So when I'm going from, I'll show you on here. When I'm going from this position, I'm in extension. Okay, I'm resting, that's fine. What I want you to make sure of is, and when they're here, remember shoulders, weight bearing, head's not, it's just resting. You've got to then push, your, think about what you did with the glute. Push through your heels, okay, push forward if you need to a little bit, and then fire your glutes. But at this point, because I'm an extension, I have to bring myself into neutral. Now when I extend, when I come up the top, I'll get to the point where I'm too tight here, and I want to extend my back, and on my back, my motor program says back to take over. But I want to say, no, 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 no. I want to do hip extension. You've really got to tell them to shorten up between their glutes and their hammies and lengthen up in their lower back and shorten up in the front. So they go from long here to short at the back here and they get really maximal movement here. If they're good enough, one-legged. All right, so they get that stability going on as well. All right, and it's all just firing those glutes up to get through these next two exercises, which are going to be great. You can put a band around their knees. What's that going to do? Include me, lateral rotators, getting them in the program. You should remind the brain, when I do hip extension, I want everything working. I don't want to be lazy. Because when you do hip extension on one leg, like that, okay, I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be dropping down. 
and causing problems. Awesome exercise. Now they're at home, give them to do it on a couch. In this exercise, bodybuilders use to get massive glutes, so there's something in that. Yeah. Girls love this exercise. Great bum toner. Awesome. Here's your number one. This is my favourite exercise just about out of all exercises that we do. Physio lunges. Not lunges. Physio lunges. I don't know if I coined it physio lunges back in the day, but I like to think so. The difference is, you might call it front foot lunges, that's the thing. I call it physio lunges just the way we do it. Now, things to take home with this are, I want that angle to be forward about 30 degrees. Okay? So, standard lunge. Straight down, straight up. With people with patellofemoral pain on the back knee, they're going to hate that. They're going to go, oh Jesus, can't do that. Now why is that? What do you think that is? What, ha what is happening biomechanically in the back of my knee when I do that? It's a shearing force going through my knee. Okay? I'm not compressing through my knee when I do that. The other thing too is there's a shearing force going through this knee as well. And there's simply the fact my body weight is not over my kneecap. Okay? And then when I go down like this, okay, it's really hard for here because all the tissues tighten up like that. And if I've got really tight quads, it's going to pull that kneecap into the groove and if it's not sitting in the groove properly, it's going to hurt. Sometimes people get it going this way and they get, oh, geez, that's sore in the front. All right? Because they're, they're doing a shearing force there. And when I bend here, I'm not getting enough glute movement, glute hip flexion to get my glutes going or I'm dropping down and I'm not firing my VMO, VMO enough. Right? The same rule applies, and people say, how far forward do I go? And see how far forward I am? I can go as far forward as I want if it's pain-free, and my heel stays on the ground, and my angle of my shin, well, you can see a shadow, it looks a bit funny with that shadow, but my back and my back thigh and my shin need to be equal, pain-free. Sometimes people do that and they still get pain. So they go, from here, they go, yeah, great, great, great. Oh, now it's sore if I do that. Okay. So those people are allowed to do this. So they don't travel forward here, but they're getting, I better do on the other leg so you can ask and see. So instead of going forward and down both even, okay, they go, to a point where they don't let their kneecap go forward, say past their toes. Nothing. It's not a. It's, it's not a written rule. But then, then they drop here. So I'm getting my hip flexion. I mean, I'm getting more and more glute meat, more and more glute max here, and then I'm driving through that leg. So if I shift my weight into the front foot, it's going to load up my kneecap. If I shift my weight into my heel, it's going to load in the mid knee joint. Get that nice compressive force. Hammies and quads working together, and I get really good activation. Then they'll go. God, I can feel that in my bum. Go perfect. So they're not fending in their knee, but they are fending their bum. And they're doing it the right thing. So very, very crucial. And it takes a lot of practice to get this right because you're trying to change a pattern of movement that they may be used to, and you're trying to completely change it. Right? And get them to focus on consciously activating muscles and using cues and go, okay, push down through your heel, and you go, what, what, what am I supposed to do? And at the same time, when they're doing this, I do it this way. This hip's got to stay up. So when they lunge down, they can't do this. Okay, so they've got to keep it there and keep it in alignment, which is very hard. So you've got to be behind them having a look and correcting them. And, it, and then the knee is not allowed to do this and go out of alignment. It's got to be there, over their second or third toe, middle of the foot between the second and the third toe. Okay, so going through there, keeping that hip in alignment. All right? And when they get enough movement there and there and through their heel and 80% of their weight on the front leg, not 20, I mean, not 50, 80%, and then when they push up, they've got to think about pushing through the floor to come up. So again, that same principle of pushing your heels down. So when you drop down, 80% goes onto the front heel, down and back into the heel. All right? And when you push up, push the heel down to come back and you'll get better glute activation. Remember, you get a bit of glute work, your knee stays in a line. If your knee stays in a line and you're doing knee extension, your 
quads are going to work and your VMO is going to work better. And that's how you get your VMO. Yep, in a closed chain position with your hip stabilisation, talking to your brain and getting that motor control back. So yeah, you only have to do it for some people. It's not about how far forward their knee goes. It's just the fact that they're bending. So they might get to a point where they go down and go, oh, no, nah, that's sore. And they think, oh, I can't do that. Well, you can just get in here and just work there and tell them that's what they've got to work on. So they get enough strength here, they slowly build up their strength, and they'll eventually get lower. And as they get better at it, their, their body weight changes, okay, forward and back. They get it down through the heel, they get better, okay, get their back foot a bit better, and away they go. Awesome exercise, okay? Put that in your program, but make sure it's not a split squat lunge where their foot's forward and they push their knee forward. Okay, it's not a normal lunge. Now, in things like pump class, they can't teach it like that. You know, it took me five minutes to teach. They're not going to teach that to everybody and make it perfect and go around every person, single person in the class and make sure it's absolutely perfect. They can't do that. So they have to do straight up and down lunges. So a lot of people who go to pump class with patellofemoral pain have to change their lunges. So get them to change their lunges. And I get them in, our, in the platinum. We say just go up to the instructor. And the instructors love it. You know? Go up to the instructor and say, I'm just doing physio lunges because I've got this knee pain. I said, cool. Because otherwise they say, hey, you're not doing your lunges right. Because they've been told to you know, keep it like that. So make sure you, you explain why you're changing it. All right? Any questions on that? Yes? So is there really a need to go to the other lunge then? What benefit is that if you don't get everything from what you need? To get? <laughs> so much education. <laughs> oh, I get everyone doing these ones. Yeah. If you can. I think, I think they're better. The thing about, okay, fun functionally, a lunge like this teaches me how to get strength from this position and push up. So it does strengthen in a different position. That's fine. Okay, you might need that in certain sports. You know, if you're getting back and you have to, you have to push up. So that, there is warranty for that, yeah. But um, tennis players, rugby players, they might need it. Um, but for rehab, stick to that. Yes. Four sets of 15. Yep. This one you can add on weights. Obviously dumbbells and things like this. That's a bit harder, but dumbbells. What I'll talk about that is, you know, is that. Where's my button? The TheraBand. Okay. Jeff's, Jeff's a favourite of this one. Putting the TheraBand around here that way which is pulling their knee in, they fight it. So there's a resistance directly for here. So rather than stacking weights on me, how about I get this fired up from a resistance that way? Okay, so putting a TheraBand on, much more effective than the weights. All right, but they'll find those exercises hard enough for weeks before you have to put on any weight. And sometimes it's not about the size, it's about the activation. Second favourite of all time, Beyond, apart from the one arm, one leg raise I showed this morning. Step downs. Now, this is not a one legged squat as you probably know it. It's not a pistol squat, okay? It's not a step up. And it's not. You'll see a lot of literature and a lot of uh, videos, and they do step downs like this. Their leg forward, okay? That's fine with people with really good control. If you're teaching someone bad control, put their leg back. So a step down, but step back and down. All right? Now, again, have a look at my angles. Tibia, upper body, doesn't really matter about the back leg because it's not planted. Okay, but tibia and upper body, well, tibia and spine, same angle. But you can change it depending on the pain. Again, this is much, this is like the physiology, same sort of principles, but when I stand on one leg, my weight's through my heel more than my toe, so I keep my weight through the mid part of my joint. I've got to make sure my knee doesn't roll in. Now, this is really hard for some people because as soon as they stand on my leg, they do that. They can't get their knee in line if they drop here. So they've got to hitch up here. But as soon as I go into flexion here, I'm lengthening all these muscles and the muscles want to switch off and they start getting the point and they just roll. So a lot of people will go, yep, I'm good here, and then it goes, does that. Okay, well, it just rolls in the bottom. Why is it rolling in the bottom? 
because they're just losing strength the, longer, the deeper they go. This is why you've been doing all those bridges and that sort of thing, to teach them how to get that position perfect. So when they go on one leg, they've at least got that. Okay? And again, being on one leg will give you way more work here and here. All right? And they can control working on getting that foot in a line and trying to keep this hip in a line, going as far as they can go, as far as they can go. When it starts rolling, then driving back up and staying on one leg. It's about endurance. All right? Again, watch that hip chop. You know? I don't want them going down. If they get to this point, then do that. Okay, they have to, have to maintain alignment. Some people, and there's a video on our website of this one to show you the differences. Some people will get to the point where they go, oh, it hurts at that point. So what you might do, and I'll show you this way, is if they get pain past 30 degrees, because it's, 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 it's when it goes in the groove and it hurts, so if they get to the point where they go, no, nah, that hurts, okay? Don't let them bend their knee too much. So they do that. They're still doing knee flexion, they're just not travelling it forward and loading up the patellofemoral joint. Yeah? So you've got to think of what the angle, if you look at the angle of my knee, okay, there's my knee flexion, but also there's the same knee flexion. Okay, it's just different mechanics. More glute activation, but some people can't do that. They can't, they get back there and they're like, I can't, I can't do that, because they haven't got the control and the confidence to do that. All right. The other thing you've got to watch too is making sure they don't initiate it with, okay, do a one-angle squat and they go bang. First thing they do is that because that's what they're used to. That's what they're confident in is knee, but they don't really know what to do here. So they've got to make sure the knee and hip go together. Okay. Sometimes people go, okay, a bang, knee, and then hip. Okay, but by then they've already lost the control because they haven't, been, they haven't got the hip control going. Okay, so it's... it's it's really pedantic, but you have to be with this stuff. And this is the difference between you doing, oh, doing a few step downs, a few lunges, and not getting better, and doing them and getting better. Because if you do these poorly or teach them poorly, they'll think, they don't work. They hurt. Okay, I'm not doing those. But if you teach them right and teach them at a low level, they really do work. Okay, it's only the people with really, really bad, bad knees that may have to stay away from this for a while. But they should be seeing the physio for... Anyway, they shouldn't, you know, they might need any acute care. Um, TheraBand. Now that gets really hard. Put a TheraBand on your knee like the lunge. Tie it that way. It'll pull their knee in. Okay? They've got to be really good at that. Then what we get for people who involve change direction in sport, especially with the ACL rehab people, get them on one of these. Okay? Doing the same thing. Get their foot in the middle of the BOSU first. Okay, when they stand on this for the first time, they'll do this, and that's their brain neurologically trying to work it out. You just put their foot on the back and get them stabilised. And within a week, they'll be like, "Okay, that's cool." Then they've got to try and do a step down on that, and then you've got to put a band around it. So rather than putting on weight, just make things more and more and more difficult for your stabilisation, which builds and builds and builds and builds their strength. Yep. Keep it level. Yeah, some people will try and. Roll it out to sort of fake a bit of alignment. Okay, try and keep it level. Most people will stand on this and put it sideways. Because if they try and keep it level, their knee rolls in. Yep. Alright. Now, VMO quads, the first two for this section are physio lunges and step downs. Okay? So they're one of my favourite because they work both together. Every knee patient comes in our doors, gets these. Sometimes variations of them. Even if they've done them before. Even if they've done them before, we get them making sure they do them absolutely perfect. And they sort of go, oh, actually, I'm not doing them actually that great. This is as hard. Okay, and get them doing it perfect. You can't lose with this stuff. And sometimes that's all it takes is just those two exercises. Some people say, doing these exercises, they're fantastic. I do them every time before I run, I feel great. Right? Sometimes that's all it takes because it does work a lot of things together. It works on a lot of alignment, a lot of postural control. And if they've got good core and things like that, it's just a matter of doing the exercises and getting them correct and getting a few muscles working and all of a sudden their pain goes away. Other people have to work harder. In the gym, 
change from a normal leg press, which is open chain pushing away, not with your hands but your feet, you know the one where you stack all the weights on, okay, great for when you don't have knee pain, awesome, use it. But when you've got knee pain, you're trying to let rehab one leg, you're better to keep it closed chain on a one leg rehab press. Let me go through and I'll show you that picture you've got in your notes. There. That's what I mean by a rehab press. I coined it rehab press. It says leg press on it, but when I say leg press to people, they jump on the other machine. So I mean rehab press. Go and put a sticker on it maybe. Rehab press. All right, closed chain. You can see what's closed chain? Body's moving. All right. When you push through that foot, push through the heel, and imagine you're pushing the plate away from you, not pushing your body back. Same principle about pushing your heels through the floor. See that theme rolling through? Better glute activation, better knee alignment, better VMI, better quads. Okay? Make sure you're not going so low that you curve your lower back. That's what happens in that other leg press. They go too low and it curves your lower back up. Puts a lot of pressure through the discs. That's why we don't get people who've got disc problems doing that open chain leg press. All right? And single leg. This won't give you too much functional, that word functional stability, being able to do this. But it'll give you a lot of strength and the components of those muscles that need strength to be able to keep that position and practice that position. Okay? So this is not a substitute for anything else. You don't go, oh, I want to do some leg press and I won't worry about those lunges. It's third on the list if you've got a gym, if you've got this. Okay? And some say, what can I do if I don't have that? Nothing. <laughs> that is what you want to do. And it's just working on strength control, difference left and right. You probably find people who step down lunges, they don't notice their strength difference, but they notice their balance and their functional difference, and their control and their balance. All right? If you get them on this, there's a massive difference in strength because it's all you need is strength for this, really. Because you're locked in that machine, you're stabilised, you're feeling good. And they do left and right, and then one side is to go, oh my God, I didn't know how weak I was. Now, if you weren't working on that, because you're not, the physio lunges and the step downs is more activation and, and endurance and control, not necessarily just straight brute strength, then you're missing out on something. So this is sort of essential in a way. Now, there's a different way of doing a step down. This is where your one-legged squat comes in, but you've got to do a one-legged squat against the wall. You start with against the ball. You're pushing out against the ball, on the right leg to activate glute, med and min and external rotators on the right leg and it forces you to work on the left leg as well. So the pressure, you're doing two legs at once but one's loading. The pressure pushing out forces the other leg, holy crap, it's just got to push back. Okay? So that's great. But it's not single leg balanced by itself. You've got some stability and control with the ball. It's like when you do a squat and you've got the other leg. So this one you've got the other leg. So again, don't use it as your primary. It's an addition. Okay? It's something to add on to get more strength and more control and yeah, yeah. Okay? I see a lot of people going for this as a, let's work on your VMO. But it's technically not completely single leg, is it? Right? You've got some sort of, your leg is connected through the wall and they're through the ground via the ball. Okay, so that one's static, the medicine ball is dynamic. Okay, it's hard to control that medicine ball dynamically, it's very hard to keep it in one position. So you use a lot of postural control. So it's again, it's adding to your regime. Alright? Um, again, make sure you can change the knee and the, change the hip angle and all that sort of thing, pushing through the heel with that exercise. Any questions with that one? Static, yeah, just here. Get in the squat, push into the wall. When you push the wall, you naturally have to work. You go, oh my lord, push into here. Whereas the ball, medicine ball one, okay, this is easy to do a squat. You just sit there, medicine ball. When you've got a medicine ball, it's small, and you oh my God, you have to try and really get your angles correct and perfect. So yeah, you can just sort of muck around with this one. OK? 
Okay, so I like using that isometric. And that burns, get that isometric control going. And I like using that one as an isokinetic. Whatever you do, when you Google stuff and go on YouTube and you say, best VMO exercise ever, and they've freaking got a medicine ball here. And I, it's just like, oh. it's always in America. The medicine ball there, what is it doing when you push the medicine ball? And they say, best VMO exercise is because it's squeezing you, push it against it. What's it doing up here? If I push it, yeah, it's switching all these off, right? So how is that going to teach me how to do that? I think it's the pressure on the ball or something. I don't know. Whatever you do, don't put a medicine ball between your legs doing squats. Put a band around your legs and pull outwards. Because we don't suffer from knee pain because our knee rolls outwards because it can't roll outwards. Okay, you don't sit there and go, geez, look at my knee, it's rolling outwards. Well, I squat, it rolls inwards when you squat. Okay, so there's no need to worry about here. You naturally get adductor control from doing this. Okay, your adductors are long, okay, for a reason, because they control just this sort of movement here. Okay, they don't have this huge big rotation movement out here. You've got six muscles out here and two glute med. Okay, you've got lots of stuff to do that. Right, remember your, your glute medium and help rotate in open chain, so they're already working. Okay, so it's not about adductors trying to control that movement. Scare squat. Okay, when you start getting advanced, this is adding in more abduction. When I move my leg out, I'm making my leg do that. It's harder. Okay, so I'm taking one leg, a step down, and I'm trying to control that way. Very functional for sport, great for these athletes who need that stepping ability and off center ability. Okay, it's a lot harder to get to this point and they go, What am I doing? Okay, so trying to get that control and trying to stop that knee rolling inwards and outwards. All right? Progressions. Right. How do we then get all this rehab stuff, this awesome rehab stuff? and get them closer to doing their normal stuff in the gym, their squats and their deadlifts and their walking lunges and all that stuff. How do we get them doing that? Again, warm up the stabilizers, get them functioning, choose some exercise that warm everything up, all right, and get that patellofemoral joint working. Try and work on all those principles you just learned, pushing through your heel, knee alignment, hip and all that sort of thing, okay? All those little cues and use them in your next set of exercises. Add the BOSU into everything you're doing. Squats, deadlifts, single leg deadlifts, step downs, add the bands on. Okay, make it harder for them but more interesting. Maybe they'll stay on board for longer when it's a little bit more interesting. Um, side steps and side jumps. So you can actually add in loading now because sometimes the pelvic femoral joint um, needs loading. It needs that ability to load and compress and move to strengthen. Okay, so don't be afraid to start getting them jumping on and off BOSUs. Let's have a look at these. So what I mean is add on a band, we talked about that with your step down, add on a BOSU and a band on a deadlift. Yeah, really hard stuff that sometimes you don't think about doing, but it's, it's what's missing for these people before they jump from rehab to just doing deadlifts. Okay? So doing single deadlifts is great, but can they do it on a BOSU? All right? To get more and more and more hip stabilization, more and more control going. Side step, especially very important for people going back from surgery or back from really severe knee pain where they've lost a lot of stability and, and, and fear of loading it, to actually give them loading that knee better. Because all the time they don't do that, they'll just do squats and then they go and try and play sport. And there's a big gap in between. This is where you guys can come in and help. When they're doing squats, deadlifts, put a band on. No harm in putting a band on. You can do 100 kilo squats with a band on, you'll just get way more lateral rotator work done and way more stability, and it teaches them to keep their knee out. Yeah? This one? Where it starts? Yep. They, the first thing they've got to learn is how to squat on and squat off. Okay, they've got to get that right first. But when they're landing on it, they're trying to land on, land on a jump like that. Yep. Mm. 
one-legged stuff. You can even use a band when they're at home. I know, it sounds silly, sounds pretty basic, okay, but they, it's, this is great stuff for them. Teach them a lot of alignment, a lot of hip control. Pistol squats, really hard. That's actually a really hard exercise. They have to have really good glute and quad control. And a lot of people cheat and compensate on this exercise, and they're using it when they're not good enough. And a lot of this sort of stuff is used at entry level by some people to do one-legged work. And they missed all the other stuff beforehand. Because for this, you need good glute control, you need good quad strength, you need no pain in your kneecap, you need good alignment to be able to do this. But then this builds strength, which is what you want. Hard exercise to do. Step ups. How many people do step ups as one of their primary things? They're just doing step ups with bad alignment. You know, and you see people doing step ups. And this will happen in step class because they do step ups in step class. As they start from here in a dropped position, okay, with this all off, and then come up through there, and then finally when they get to the top, then they lift. But on the way through, what's happened? If they're down here and they drive through that knee, that knee can't stay in a line when it's dropped here. It's on an angle. Yeah? So they need to be in that position there when they step up. So you've got to get them being able to step up with a level pelvis all the way up and all the way down. Some people will come up with a really high box and then they'll step down and they'll get to this point and then they'll go like that. And during that point is the crucial part of when they need that VMO control. And if the knee's rolling in, they probably won't get it. So work on the alignment of that one. I mean, that's a hard exercise. So when you next look at that exercise and you see people doing weights with it, you think, have they got the control for it? Are they going to cause a patellofemoral joint problem because they don't have hip stability to do this exercise and they overload? Is this exercise going to cause them a problem? It's also a really good exercise to build strength, but you've got to do it correctly. Yep. Eccentric knee control. Now I'm going to finish on this one before we wrap up. This one is a touchy subject. <laughs> okay. People with really bad patellofemoral joint wear shouldn't really be doing this unless they've got really good alignment. So when the, when the kneecap's back in that nice compressive force, imagine if it's out on the side and I try and get them doing knee extension, it's going to hurt. But if they've got good, good alignment, it'll actually promote some strength work. But you've got, sorry, you've got to do it eccentrically on the way down. Always two up, hold one, take one away on the way down. I would only do this under guidance from a physio to make sure, absolutely sure they are allowed to do it. And it's a very small population of people. So I put it in there saying it's great for VMO when the VMO is weak if they've got everything else working in alignment and they're under safe conditions. Okay, it will help them. And if you're going to choose it, then you've got to choose it wisely. All right? But nine times out of ten, you probably won't use this. Remember, the VMO is only controlling the kneecap, so turning the foot out is not really going to make a difference for people. Okay. They should have found it with all the other exercises. Yep. Yep. No, I'd choose I would I would I would rather you had this person in your setting first and under your control and your care before you give this to the person just randomly. Yep. Okay, things to be aware of. Quads, tightness, hip tightness, work on those things. ITB rollers for those guys with ITB tightness. Alright? Massage stretching. Sometimes that's all it takes. Like I said, with the shoulder, you just might find that all you need to do is loosen up that ITB, stretch their quads out. Shift the glutes out and their pain goes away. But remember, there's probably some underlying weakness in there of why it's tightening up. Or maybe it's their foot that's pronating. Okay, so sometimes treating the symptoms isn't the best thing to do long term. It's a quick fix, but you've got to look underneath that. The muscle balance, with, again, quads is hamstrings. Sometimes people have really poor hamstrings and overdevelop the quads. You see this huge big VMO, but they've still got knee pain when they do running. Maybe it's their hamstrings. Q angle, we talked about wide Q angle, pronation, maybe a need for better shoes, orthotics, things to be aware of. Um, always, core stability is always in there. 
Um, and think, when things get harder, card is where these really need to be professionally assessed. Okay? And see, are they really allowed to go back and doing 20k marathons if they've got too much wear in their kneecap? Choose your rehab press over your leg press. Yeah? And single leg work over double leg work because you know now what it does for you. All right? Cool. Any questions so far? Yes? Ah, well, you can get knee pain from not having a sartorius working, but it's pretty rare. Yeah, it's pretty rare. We've had people come in with sartorius tears and their pain is in like a line like this. And they do it usually from a twisting injury in sport. But it's really rare. Really rare. Okay, see it? So you may need to work out why they're excessively tight. So you've got to work out why that is. Yeah. Um, physio lunges over normal lunges, so we showed you before. Maybe limit their running distances, but then progress their running distances up. You've got to get the endurance back with them. Just because they, if they can do 2K, great, but then you've got to build their strength so they can do what they want to do. But again, maybe there's a limit on what they can do and just making sure you change their routine if they're in pain. So, think about this one. One to two weeks, they've got to be pain-free at least. Okay, that's what we aim for, just at rest. Pain-free single squat, it's going to take them two to three weeks usually to get that pain-free. And they've got to do their rehab exercises at least for the first four weeks just to get some sort of change. You've got to keep them on board for that amount of time, then you've got to keep them going. So, Going back to doing normal squats and lunges deadlifts, maybe at the four-week mark, maybe at the six-week mark, because that's how long it's going to take them to correct everything. Just enough to get them their pain down so they can do those exercises. But then they've got to keep those exercises in because at that four-week mark, they're nowhere near perfect. They've still got to keep going. Um, and in sport, six to eight. So use some ideas of use those exercises. Once they're fine, use those exercises in their warm-up to keep them in their program. Or you just devote a whole day to that, to that warm-up, uh, to that rehab, um, and make sure they keep back in touch with the physio, make sure they're going okay. Um, and education on, you know, just because you've done those exercises and you're feeling better now, doesn't mean that they're going to stay that way. Uh, you've got to keep pumping up the tyres and making sure that that, you know, always retesting that, have they still got it? Do we still need to keep doing those exercises? So... Um, just to finish off, guys, so any of you personal trainers or physios, anyone who wants to see me or my colleague, my colleague's out west, I'm in the east, we also do, we do you know, normal consultations for you guys, but also anything on the phone or if you want to bring clients in, that sort of thing, we also do that as well. So if you've got a client you're not sure, if it doesn't come to our gym, you can bring them in and have a consult together with us and we give you a, we give you a cheaper rate for that than normal. Um, all our news feeds, all our uh, exercise we release, our articles, everything I like is on our Facebook. So if you want to catch up that information, get all our articles and stuff that get released, jump on that. Um, and those, ex those handouts you've got are on our website. But if you want the actual exercise sheets we give to our patients, jump on the website. There's a library page there. Click on that. You can download that exercise sheet. It's got all the cues and how to do everything, which is really good for your clients. And those videos that I showed you today are on our YouTube account. All right, thanks very much.